These identities are not fixed entities. They will change over time, they'll mature, and in some cases they might fade away, only to be replaced, only to be replaced by something else. Importantly, their potential for change differs at different levels. So for example, a person who moves from Gildani to Sabutalo is more likely to shed her Gildani identity than she is to shed her Georgian identity if she were to move to Armenia instead. Do you hear me? Properly? Good. Cities also have identities. They're inscribed in their built heritage as much as they are in their everyday practices of their inhabitants. Urban identities, like those of individuals, are multiple and complex, often contested, and far from being fixed. And even so, they are relatively slow moving, even when confronted with dramatic changes associated with critical junctures. Urban identities are collective identities rooted in the cities past and present, where the past influences the present, and the present sometimes influences the past. And by saying that the past influences the present, what I'm trying to say is that urban identities are both cumulative and transformative. For example, a gentrifying working class neighborhood often builds its self-image, perhaps even its legitimacy, on the neighborhood's authentic proletarian past. Yet it fetishizes it at the same time, as the example, pardon me, of the Fabrica Multicomplex in Tbilisi illustrates quite nicely. Now, of course, the identity of gentrifying neighborhoods is at least as much crafted by developers as it is generated by the gentrifiers themselves. Yet it remains dependent on the past, which might need to be revisited. Thus, by saying that the present can influence the past, I mean that the past is subject to the constant risk of being reinterpreted or rewritten in order to benefit the present. This doesn't mean that history be falsified. It may be corrected. It may be improved. Sosa is telling me that I'm shouting. Excuse the passion. I need that. I know. There is something you tell you. Despite the plurality of urban identities that may be present in any given city, there tends to be an overarching city self that is surprisingly stable. This city self does not necessarily offer an accurate description of contemporary reality. Manchester is the industrial city, yet less than 10% are employed in manufacturing. Venice is a seafaring city, a global focal point of culture and art, yet it has lost most of its inhabitants no sign of a trend reversal. And at a higher, but also much vaguer level, however, urban identities encapsulate the regional and national identities associated with the larger community, community that they belong to. Sometimes, there are so many of them that we might refer to certain cities as ultimately cosmopolitan. But even in these cases, we would be tempted to classify them, first and foremost, according to some kind of continental, or perhaps subcontinental typology. Johannesburg is an African city. Hong Kong is Asian, Berlin is European, as are Brussels and Glasgow and Paris and Stockholm. The temptation of referring to such simplified regional schemata has also proved strong among academics, or perhaps especially among academics, who, for example, rush to assign post-socialism as a relevant descriptor for cities located throughout the former Moscow-controlled world. Tbilisi, for example, is first and foremost post-socialist in the eyes of many scholars, not only in the Anglo-American world, but also in post-socialist countries. Problem likewise, claiming and retaining the status of post-socialist is, in my opinion, not just an act of othering committed by foreign scholars or of self-immolation by local scholars. It is also an inherently, inherently geopolitical act of nullification in the sense that it seems irrelevance incompleteness, inferiority, and lack of agency, subalternity in other words. It also signals a general lack of belonging, for what does Prague have more in common with Tbilisi or Tashkent than it does with Nuremberg or Verona? And why are Tel Aviv and Tel Aviv more different than Chita and Jedburg? This lack of belonging was quickly recognized across the Central European region, as well as in the Baltics, which adopted a policy of rapid return to Europe as soon as the uh, communist regimes were ousted from power. This was intended to be less of a rhetorical trick and more of a geopolitical statement, 
crowned by these nations of mission to the European Union and NATO. Above all, there seems to have been a genuine commitment to re-becoming European after decades of communist phenomenological displacement. Even though communism itself is a European crafted ideology, rooted in the centennial buildup of European political philosophy. But what Europe, what Europe were Slovakia and Latvia returning to? And what Europe and Georgia and Ukraine and Moldova want to join? They do. On the one hand, there are those who claim that these countries naturally belong, naturally belong to the Western civilization, to use Samuel Huntington's dubious concept. This would be the position within certain nationalist circles. For the most part, however, Europe represents the achievement of a higher state of economic development coupled with liberal democracy. Francis Fukuyama's famed end of history, in other words, the end point of a dialectical process for which the contradictions of past political economic existence have been resolved. Yet, the ground level realities of this Europe are far from uniform. Economic development is highly uneven, and liberal democracy is no longer universally accepted. In fact, <coughs> Orban and Kachinsky aside, liberalism is increasingly challenged across the entire Europe. Thus, while some have warned of the Putinization of Hungarian and Serbian politics, Orbanization poses a more direct threat in the short run, for it has greater potential appeal to the urban middle classes than do Vladimir Putin's excesses. If for many years urban populations were reluctant to vote for parties with extremist agendas, Viktor Orban has been able to deliver <coughs> somewhat more broadly political mainstream authoritarianism, which he himself proudly refers to as illiberal democracy. This is not a new concept, of course. Fareed Zakaria warned us about this risk already back in 1997. Its novelty, however, lies in its relatively rapid emergence within the heart of Europe. Consider the following. Addressing a crowd of students in 2014, Orban noted that, and I quote, the most popular topic in thinking today is trying to understand how systems that are not Western, not liberal, not liberal democracies, and perhaps not even democracies, can nevertheless make their nation successful. Orban continues, the stars of the international analysts today, whoever these analysts may be, are Singapore, China, India, Russia, and Turkey. Urbanization, end quote. Urbanization, seen in this light, implies a relatively straightforward shift in geopolitical thinking. No secrets here. It is, all in all, de-Europeanization, although Orban, like Putin, on some occasions at least, presents or perhaps misrepresents himself as one of the few defenders of traditional European values, whatever they may be. So summing up, however we choose to evaluate the political deeds of Europe's growing club of authoritarian leaders, there is little doubt that they are gradually eroding the foundations and liberal democratic values upon which the European Union is based, as well as the perceived legitimacy of its painstakingly built institutions. It is as if the long-awaited return to Europe failed to deliver according to exaggerately high expectations placed on it. Returning to Europe, with the quotation of Marx, has thus become a journey with an unclear destination. But I'm convinced it nevertheless remains a journey still worth taking. When Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova signed their respective association agreements with the European Union, important practical steps were introduced. But the symbolic meaning is far more powerful. Suddenly, previously hesitant Europeanization gathered a new measure of confidence, while demoscovization hopped over from the realm of possibility by that of desirability to that of inevitability to the extent that it is now inscribed in the Ukrainian constitution. However, not even the constitution can change the fact that many Ukrainians feel uncertain about the country's so-called European choice. 
Indeed, residents in such major cities as Kharkiv and Dnipro do not seem to identify as Europeans to any greater extent. And I have to, I have to turn around now just to say. <clears throat> According to my own surveys in these cities, which were conducted over the course of the year 2018 with the field assistance of the reputable Kiev International Institute for Sociology, only one in five residents in Kharkiv feels European and a mere 3.7 percent, that's less than 1 in 25, feel clearly European. They answer to the question, do you feel European, by saying either Skerida, which would be included in feel European, or Skerida, or sorry, Skerida and Da are feel European, and Da is feel clearly European. So those who just said yes are 3.7 percent. It's not very much. Even so, one in four would support joining the European Union in, um, in Kharkiv, which suggests that the EU is not necessarily viewed as uh, purely driven by cultural homophily. Still, one in four is not much for Europe's 16th largest city. By contrast, by contrast, almost half of, of the residents of Kharkiv feel Soviet and almost one in five, most definitely so. And while moderate Soviet identification is not explicitly at odds with feeling European, the more clear-cut versions of Europeanness versus Sovieticity are almost mutually exclusive. In Dnipro, by the way, the pattern is similar. Dnipro is the former Dnipro Petros, uh, but well, there's slightly more Europeans, probably one in four, and there's also substantially greater EU support, almost 40%, and also a small, somewhat smaller share of, of Soviets, as you can see. Uh, they're about 40%. And in both cities, feeling European is associated with a higher probability of um, supporting EU membership for Ukraine and even NATO, which historically hasn't been very popular in the eastern part of Ukraine. And the opposite is true for those who identify as Soviet. Perhaps somewhat surprisingly, and this you can't even see here, feeling Russian in Kharkiv is more likely to be associated with feeling European than is the case for those who feel Ukrainian. On, in Dnipro, on the other hand, this association is no longer present. So to sum up, European identity is not strong in either of these cities, nor in support for the constitutionally inscribed European force. Moreover, there are interesting variations between the Nipur and Kharkiv that will probably have to be interpreted more in the light of the specific context of these cities. But again, Kharkiv and Nipur are cities that have embarked on a path of Europeanization. Perhaps it would be better to say that Europeanization is being forced on them or imposed on them, considering that the majority of the population do not recognize themselves as, as European, as we've seen. But whatever the case, whatever the case, the revolution of dignity, like the Rose Revolution in Georgia, uh, 10 years before was a turning point. One of the first steps taken by the new Ukrainian authorities was to introduce the so-called, as you know, decommunization laws. It's about time. The Lenins, Zizhinskis, Barashilos, Zajanikizis, and so on had to fall, and they had to be replaced by something more supportive of uh, the Ukrainian nation building. <coughs> Here's one of them. In Luhansk, uh, Zizhinsky. Petrovsky had to be ostracized from Dmitro uh, Petrovsky. State, streets, bridges, train stations, all had to be renamed. And the clear geopolitically flavored move, the Moskovsky train station in Kiev was renamed Dinivsky, whereas Moscow's Kievsky equivalent will presumably never be renamed. Those communist leaders who uh, have survived are located on the territory occupied by Russia or controlled by its proxies in the Donbass, where their status has even been revived. So for example, in Luhansk, other than Zizhinsky, the uh, former Barashilov Grant, Klim Barashilov is um, close to being a patron saint. A certain local personality called surrounding him has in fact outlived the Soviet period and is now feeding into the overarching founding myth of the Luhansk People's Republic. So, in other words, if and when Luhansk returns to Ukrainian government control, decommunization will likely be met with even greater resistance than it has been so far. Now, again, although communism itself 
was a European political innovation. Communist nostalgia and feeling Soviet are big obstacles facing any society that wants it Europeanized. However, you understand this. But they pose an even greater threat during the state and nation building processes. And perhaps ironically, totalitarian communism becomes more dangerous the more it fades away into the past. Memories of dreaded red, red, red lines may have helped those who endured the dire conditions of the 1990s accept their predicament, but millennials lack such direct reference points, and their offspring will even more so. And in fact, liberal democracy's other main competing ideology of the 20th century, fascist totalitarianism, has also regrown dangerous in Europe, as you know. Arguably, it took longer for fascism than it's taken for communism because of the former's comprehensive delegitimization in Europe after World War II. Communism, despite its legacy of mass murders, deportations, interrogations, incarcerations, was never truly delegitimized. To the contrary, the fact that communists fought fascists during the war, that they won, and that the crimes committed in the name of communism were effectively concealed for decades, ascribe them an enviable measure of moral authority. Instead, communism gradually discredited itself, and the, the more it became apparent that it was failing to deliver. And by 1989, it had lost most of its appeal in the West. Even the Italian Communist Party collapsed, once possibly the most powerful of its kind outside of the Second World. What has emerged instead is a form of political populism that cherry picks from the less authoritarian, of, of, sorry, of authoritarian ideology with the identification of an external enemy as a common denominator. For Putin, it is the West. For Orban, it is George Soros. For Matteo Salvini and Luigi Di Maio, the de facto duemperor of Italy, it is Emmanuel Macron. For the Brexit, it is Brussels. And for everyone, it apparently is the immigrant population, and especially the refugee population. Ladies and gentlemen, Europe is a splendid political project, but it is delicate and now faces biggest threat ever. Europeanization, as intended in the EU association agreement countries, is in my opinion even more difficult and even more gravely threatened. For Europeanization to succeed, several things are necessary. First of all, it has to be defined. For this, person, for this purpose, the association agreement only goes halfway. It's a technical document. And it describes the relevant EU acquis that needs to be incorporated by the signatory states. It contains stipulations related to free trade and deserves a number of other commitments to be met by the signatory states, including necessary judicial and economic reforms. The second layer of the journey is the one that everyone actually talks about. It's the issue of what it means to become European and how this can be achieved. Second, however Europeanization is conceptualized and defined, it needs stable consensus. This consensus should be based on realistic expectations. And above all, it should not be taken for granted. Italy used to be one of the most pro-European states in the Union, but decades of creeping populism, starting with Silvio Berlusconi's election in 1994, have eroded the population's trust in European institutions. And once this trust became sufficiently eroded, became ripe for politicization, creating new incentives for populist politicians to advance increasingly nationalist agendas by using Europe and the Euro as scapegoat for the country's economic stagnation. In the process, populists have leaned on strategies that build on deception, as was the case in the run-up to the Brexit referendum in the UK. They rely and continue relying on a ruse that spews fake news. I would argue that one of the main reasons for the EU's failure to sustain high levels of consensus has a lot to do with its failure to present itself as more than an economic project, the benefits of which are doubtlessly uneven when viewed across the diverse territory covered by the Union. Europe is first and foremost a peace project aimed at ensuring the peaceful coexistence of its peoples. Dense economic ties and the enshrinement of democracy is thought sustain this peaceful development, for democracies are not known to fight each other, while the presence of economic ties increases the costs of armed conflict. In other words, the desire for European integration 
should not rest solely on expected gains and prosperity, for there is no guarantee that such an expectation will be fulfilled. Instead, the European choice, as it's termed in, in Ukraine, should be made based on the European project's record of fostering peace and cooperation between the countries that are part of it. Third, the success of Europeanization requires full commitment to liberal and not illiberal democratic values, and democratic institutions need to be guarded against the risk of authoritarian backlash, which is particularly noteworthy in times of economic crisis, as was the case in Hungary, as a matter of fact. Democracy is particularly fragile when it relies on economic performance to preserve its legitimacy. Fourth, and this is pretty obvious, the European choice implies choosing, not a problem European choice, common sense, implies choosing the rule of law, transparency and decision making, and a commitment to reducing the incidence of corruption. And finally, Europeanization should not be made the equivalent of joining the EU at any cost. And it should not be a path taken purely as a demonstration of geopolitical orientation. EU membership may be a desirable goal, but it's not a panacea for the many problems facing aspiring members. Moreover, the goal itself could be a moving target. Currently, unfortunately, there seems little to, there seems to be little appetite, appetite for new EU members. Again, I've been told to be quiet. No, slow down. Translation. It's, it's awesome. <coughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to fast. You're great. Thank you. <laughs> So getting back to the point here, the goal of joining the EU could in itself be a moving target. Currently, there seems to be little appetite for new EU members on behalf of the existing member states. Moreover, this appetite seems to differ from case to case. Turkey, a longtime member of NATO, made substantial efforts to join, but it only received half-hearted commitments in return. Poland's return to Europe, on the other hand, met little resistance, suggesting that geography and possibly geopolitics matter when countries take their European entrance exams. <laughs> Indeed, geography and perhaps even more so geopolitics are crucial to the European aspirations of the EU Association Agreement countries. Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, while very different on many accounts, share the following characteristics. First, they rank among the poorest countries having endured the transition from communism, but they are nevertheless relatively, relatively democratic. Second, they're located on the geographical margins of EU Europe. Other than, other than being mountainous, Georgia is in Switzerland. Third, they used to be part of the core states of the communist empire. <coughs> Fourth, they are perceived by Russia as being part of their sphere, I'm really literally quoting the sphere of privilege in, uh, interests. This is what pseudo-president Medvedev claimed after he made in Georgia in 2008. And um, also, they are claimed by Lavrov in this case to belong to a civilizational unity. In other words, put these things together and it becomes a sphere of influence. Mm. Fifth, their territorial integrity is violated by Russia, which subjects them to partial military occupation, and in the case of Ukraine, to ongoing armed conflict. Sixth, their populations are divided in their opinions about the European choice, reflecting certain regional, social class space, and, to a lesser extent, ethnic divisions. These six characteristics mean that Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova must deal with several huge challenges in order to become, or to complete the transition, and to a lesser extent, uh, sorry, uh, to, well, to complete the transition towards this European choice. In other words, to complete a transition from being, from having a European choice to having a European voice. The first challenge is that a long-term political consensus surrounding becoming a European voice needs to be achieved. Currently, consensus does not exist in Moldova or Ukraine, nor is it 
absolutely fully evident in Georgia either. The second challenge regards the reintegration of territories that aren't under government control. This problem has many dimensions, of course, and I cannot delve into them here. But the fact remains that the Donetsk People's Republic, or the Moldovan Dniester Republic, or even South Ossetia, at some point in the not too distant future, will change their de facto administrative statuses. Russia may want to preserve Donetsk in its state of exception as locus of a so-called frozen conflict that in fact isn't so frozen, but the whole idea of Donetsk Republic is pretty ridiculous to be frank. At some point, Donetsk will either return to Ukraine, which Ukraine we do not know, or it will be annexed or admitted into the Russian Federation. This is what I expect at least. If and when Donetsk does return to Ukraine in control, the authorities will face the daunting task of reintegrating IDPs and refugees, many of whom will have spent the war years being exposed to very different narratives of the conflict. They will also need to Europeanize the region alongside re-Ukrainianizing it. Re-Ukrainianization will be difficult, but feasible. After all, the majority of the region's inhabitants are Ukrainian, albeit Russian-speaking. Europeanization, on the other hand, will be more difficult for various reasons. First, the local population has had very little contact with Europe west of Kiev. Europe is too abstract for all of us. And then second, the West has a history of being demonized in the region, first by the Soviets, then by the Ukrainian Communist Party, then by the Party of Regions, and now especially by the Donetsk uh, de facto authorities. The absurdity of this demonization might actually turn into an asset if the population ceases to believe in it, the way the Soviet population lost its trust in the uh, incessant nonsense, nonsense that was trumpeted on Soviet television. But I'm not too optimistic. Third, unlike Ukrainianization, which requires amending a national identity that, however blurred or contested, actually already exists, Europeanization requires crafting a new geopolitical identity from scratch. In order to stitch Ukrainian national identity, someone will have to provide convincing evidence that Donetsk shares more with Kiev than it does with Moscow. Europeanization, on the other hand, needs to provide convincing evidence that Donetsk has more in common with Stockholm than it does with the eponymous Donetsk, located just across the Russian border in the Stoke Oblast, and that this commonality justifies a shift in geopolitical orientation that is enshrined in the Ukrainian constitution. In other words, while a Ukrainian city self would need to be recreated in Donetsk, its European self has yet to be invented. And it has many enemies. Perhaps a start would be to rename the city to its most European of names, Yusufka, from John Hughes, the founder of the city. It used to be called Yusufka, why not? Return to that. They've renamed almost all of the cities in the Donbass and the Ukrainian side, but not the yet. So that would, it would create a direct connection to Wales at the other end of Europe. Europeanization, unfortunately, isn't very easy to, um, to claim based on a UK example nowadays for obvious reasons. But even so, it does create a very bipolar uh, Europeanized identity. Europeanization is a process of increasing identify, identification with the good Europe. It presupposes the embracement of its culture of political pluralism, of its respect for freedom of speech and conscience, and of economic liberalism. And on top of that, we sometimes encounter the notion of being used as synonym, or perhaps as euphemism for modernization, even though it is very much not the same thing. And this part of the statistical jargon leaves lots of degrees of freedom, and a Europeanized Georgia or Moldova or Ukraine could have many faces. Europe is not a clear destination, and the European city even less so. Hence the question, how do we introduce European planning practices in Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova? Represents the problem, misrepresents the problem, sorry. 
Europeanized cities and Europeanized planning don't exist. But planning takes place in European cities. Planning takes place in cities located in Europe. And it takes place in very different ways. Sometimes it hardly takes place at all. And even within a single country, extreme variation may coexist. So consider, for example, two cities in Italy, Palma Nova and Palma di Montechiaro. Palma Nova, located on the wealthy plains of the northeastern region of Fiume and Giulia, might already be known to you. It mainly tends to appear in textbooks of urban planning as a prime example of the utopian late Renaissance Starford city. You recognize Palma Nova. Uh, You've seen this before. <coughs> I'm sure many have, maybe somewhere in, the, in, the, in their archives of memory. The city's spectacular and bordering geometry notwithstanding, Palma Nova was no success initially, and the city's Venetian overlords decided to populate it with hardened criminals who moved various change for various subsidies, including land. Nowadays, on the other hand, Palma Nova is an integral part of the tissue of small and medium-sized cities dotting the northern Italian region. It is as metaphorically European as it gets. That, that's the piazza, Palma Nova. A beautiful hexagonal structure. Palma di Montechiaro, on the other hand, is not quite as well known. Located on the southern coast of Sicily, and with a population about 10 times larger than that of Palma Nova, of about 22,000 inhabitants, Palma is one of the major towns in the poor province of Aegean, the ancient Agragas, a Greek colony. It was established in the 1600s, and the, the initial plan for the city envisaged a gridiron pattern grafted upon an actual structure that was intended to reproduce no less than Jerusalem's. Like much of the southern part of Sicily, Palma never experienced true industrialization. And even today, most of the employed work within the primary sector. After World War II, poverty was widespread, and many people left Palma for the wealthier regions of the north, as well as for Germany, Belgium, Switzerland, other places where there was a labor shortage. <clears throat> The city thus became trapped in a situation common in many developing countries. There was no development in production, but starting from the 1970s, a construction boom took place, fueled by money invested by the Paul Means diaspora. This is analogous to what my colleagues Sosa Salubadze, Dato Buishi, and I call teleurbanization when observing a similar phenomenon, guess where, in Tbilisi. Remote controlled urbanization is another way we could term teleurbanization. The positive side is that teleurbanization created some jobs, but their jobs have unfortunately detract from the city's living conditions. By the early 2000s, of, out, uh, out of 12,000 dwellings in Palma, approximately 5,000 were uninhabited, scarring the landscape of the city with the skeletons of countless unfinished buildings. This is, for example, the landscape along the uh, main through fair in Primo Macho, the first of May Street. And as you can see, the landscape in general is very unfinished, and quite typically, the top floors are uninhabited because they're intended as return apartments for members of the extended family who who do not really consider moving back but still invest in this kind of environment. And there's a lot of unfinished objects like the back, in the, in the back. So this is the Ulitsa Piero Maya. Just across the street from Lenin Street, we have this charming piazza that displays similar characteristics of unfinished urbanism. And as if that were not enough, these panoramic apartments in Mount Zedum Street also demonstrate that the, uh, the construction boom is really for no purpose. By now, I guess you can guess which political majority must have populated the municipality in this town back in the 70s and 1980s. 
There's also Che Guevara streets, uh, one of the main streets is the Uitza Gaiba Mare Sadia Gaiba Mare. So you get the idea. Yeah. Anyway, a large part of these dwellings, inhabited or not, were erected in breach of planning regulations. Europe, I mean, Italy has a relatively advanced planning legislation, but one thing is the, the legislation, the other thing is the actual enforcement. In many cases, to be sure, the breach is not fully intentional. For the most part, however, this is the outcome of a culture of illegality that has plagued Sicily for a very long time. So the typical pattern, once again, is that dwellings are erected stepwise, often on top of existing structures that house the older generations. The idea is that each new floor will be reserved then for members of the extended family, either for future return or as seasonal dwellings. Now, as I just mentioned earlier, this is teleurbanization similar to what we see in Georgia. But it is teleurbanization that is taking place in a context of complete absence of development. And it's not a local idiosyncrasy. You'll find similar problems across the world, in Albania, probably in parts of Georgia, in Turkey, in Romania, in Moldova also, as far as I understand. Uh, and that's in Europe. You'll find similar things in Ecuador, in Latin America, in Peru and in Bolivia, and so forth. And moreover, a slowdown in this type of process is nowhere to be seen. So, what kind of Europeanization do we want to see in the cities of EU association agreement countries? Palmanova might look more appealing, and it may be the embodiment of the imagined Europe, but is it an option? Of course not. Palma in Monte Chiaro is the other extreme. To some extent, a place where metaphorical Europe is nowhere to be seen. But where Europe remains present in the hearts and minds of the people. But not a political project. For both Palmas contributed to electing the current populist government in almost equal measure. In Palmanova, 53% voted for either of the three main populist and Eurosceptical parties. Lega, Five Star Movement, and the neo-fascist Fratelli d'Italia, which means the Italian brothers, uh, ironically headed by a woman. Uh, an even greater share, about 60%, voted for this constellation in Palma di Montechiaro, albeit mostly for the Five Star Movement, which campaigned on the empty promise of free money for all, in the form of uh, citizen uh, salaries, basically. How do you call it? Um, Subsistence. Yeah, basic income, yeah. But uh, it's a huge basic income that is absolutely uncovered by any hypothetical budget in Italy. And mind you, these figures, 53 versus 60 percent, they do not include the many small parties with very questionable agendas for whom, uh, for which people have actually voted in Italy. So anything from extreme Marxist organizations to even more fascist uh, inclined uh, parties. So the traditional mainstream parties are really a minority in both places. In other words, post-war Europe has never been, never before been in such peril. So where does this leave us? Or not? What is left of the European choice when applied to cities is not European essence, but the essence of common sense. The planning legislation needs to be updated and implemented under the conditions of rule of law. Planning needs to enable and facilitate a desirable development in cities, and it is necessary to learn from Europe and learn from its mistakes, as Antonio said yesterday, rather than uncritically accepting a package of best practices and overall enlightened guidance. The obvious principle should be the need to work for social, economic, and environmental sustainability, which means that cities should be prosperous, inclusive, cohesive, clean. Over and above this common sense, however, Europeanization in cities is sometimes understood as the implementation of aesthetically European interventions in urban space. Such interventions are very diverse and not always so European, and that's fine, but they should preferably at least not damage the prospects for the successful implementation of the broader political and geopolitical project that the European choice actually represents. 
Buildings in themselves are not the problem, nor are they the solution. It is the meaning that we attach to them that matters. And this meaning is in constant dialogue with the city self. In this sense, he is Comfort Town, which is a <clears throat> gated residential complex that markets itself as little Europe, does little good for describes non-European otherness to its surroundings. Kostya will tell us more about it later. And quite frankly, it doesn't look too European if you ask me. Despite its inspiration from traditional Flemish villages, as, as the developer claims, this looks more like a cross between an American gated community and a Soviet Mikhailon, sprinkled with the colors of tropical Lasau. Scandia Town, in a neighboring satellite city of Brulari, is a little bit better. It looks just as Scandinavian as the waterfront in Falcon Cardiff, but at least it attempts to produce a brand of distinction that mainly relies on its own strengths in architecture and layout, rather than on the perceived weaknesses of its non-European surroundings. Little, little Europe, Comfort Town in other words, and Scandia, don't make Kiev any more European than it would have been otherwise. A European city is a city whose inhabitants identify as European, not in a civilizational sense, Alhamdulillah, but in the sense that they identify with and value the principles associated with metaphorical Europe. That vague concept that includes democracy, freedom, peace, and cooperation, and pardon me for sounding like a Clintonite in the 90s. Accordingly, the European choice should not be seen as a pragmatic step towards economic prosperity, even though increased prosperity may be one of its likely outcomes. Therefore, to conclude, I think a crucial issue in both EU member states and in the association agreement countries is that the population needs to comprehend the true worth of an association of countries that are committed to values that we may perceive as universal. The steady decline in EU support and the rise of national sovereignty populism, which have both accelerated over the past few years, do not stem from a decreasing belief in these core values. They stem from the fact that they are being taken for granted. And it is for this reason, ladies and gentlemen, that Europe needs Georgia's, Ukraine's, and Moldova's European voice. A voice that is there to remind us all that the values fought for by earlier generations of Europeans are still worth fighting for, perhaps more than ever before. Thank you. Thank you. In agreement with David for uh, having asked you to slow down, but uh, um, but I couldn't see if they were having some trouble back there, and uh, uh, so I apologize for that because it was not a good. Anyway, the, the, the big thing is this, um, you know, <clears throat> and I'd like to hear your opinion uh, regarding this. Um, over, there, I think there are two problems in our union. One, uh, which is also felt in the United States, which is the, the idea of uh, political correctness to over to degrees that are excessive. The second one, which I think is also not good in our Europe, is because that unleashes, when I say political correctness, it unleashes the other side. In the case of the U.S., is that the, the uh, alligator growers are they that come out in, in ports voting for Trump? Uh, so that's you know a reaction to that political correctness. The second one is the over bureaucratic aspects of Brussels. You know, and that is the reason why, in my opinion, why uh, uh, Brexit was has was successful. It was successful. They voted out. We don't know if they won out, that's a different story. But they did vote out. So these two things. One, over political correctness. Two, uh, um, uh, over bureaucratic processes. As a hindrance for our union. 
This my question. Right. First of all, it's geographically uneven. So, what you when, when you talk about political correctness, you're talking about the, the Scandinavian version, to some extent, America and so forth. Where I come from in Italy, this never existed. Yet, populism has developed perhaps even more strongly in Italy than anywhere else in Europe. So I, it, it's, it, there may very well be a connection, but I'm not at all convinced that it's a causal, it's a causal link. It could be, it could be that it varies from context to context, but I, I, I don't think we can, as a rule, say that the one thing leads to the other thing. This has been kind of bubbling for a long time, and it's been bubbling irrespective of the context. Look at Central and Eastern European countries too. Political correctness really never made a breakthrough in this region compared to Sweden. And yes, where do we have the biggest authoritarian backlashes? Largely in Central, Europe, Central European countries at the moment, not to mention in Russia. But Russia has very different reasons underlying the authoritarian backlash. One of them, I, I believe, which is even perhaps more important, is the issue of nostalgia. Right. And, and of the increasing distance from the ground level the uh, realities of communism. Like the same thing in Italy, the increasing distance from the ground level realities of fascism means that fascism has revived. There's tons of fascist parties in Italy. Some are more fascist than others, but very often, and, and they're openly fascist, you know, they very, uh, Apologists of, of fascism. The, even Mussolini's grandfather is, 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 is actually actually active. She's, she's active in politics. So I, I don't believe in that causal connection. I do believe in, in the fact that it may be there, but I don't think we can say it's a rule. Bureaucracy is the second issue. I don't have personal it experience. Of, sorry? Excess of. Excess of bureaucracy, yes. Now, First of all, the vast majority of the people who voted in the Brexit referendum have no personal experience of this bureaucracy. They've only been told by Boris, among others, that Brussels is a bureaucratic hell. Now, try and get an Italian passport at the Italian consulate. <laughs> try it. Maybe, maybe that, maybe bureaucracy is, is a reason for populist sentiments. And bureaucracy is very often embedded in an anti, uh, in an anti-mainstream narrative. But again, one thing is the experience of bureaucracy, and one is the, the bureaucracy that's talked about. That said, yes, if you apply for European funding, is much worse than applying for Norwegian or Swedish funding when it comes to research. That's all the bureaucracy I've had to do with. It, that's true. But it's also a bureaucracy that somehow finds a common denominator, sorry, a common denominator among bureaucratic processes across European countries. It's kind of a way of bringing, bringing the level of bureaucracy to the worst imaginable across the continents. That, that is my, my impression. But, but again, the main thing is that talking about bureaucracy is not the same thing as having experienced it. And everyone in Europe has experienced different degrees. And if anything, contact with authorities and bureaucracies has become simpler and not more difficult at the national level for various reasons. There are fewer papers that have to be filled in today, but there are more online forms. And there are more people that might feel uh, displaced by the increasing digitalization of bureaucracy. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, actually, yes, I wanted to make a comment, a very romantic comment about the European uh, Union and the importance of European society and the cultural achievement of it. And as your comment was, that there is no such thing as European way of planning. I wanted to say that, yes, that's very much true, but what we can strive for is for supporting European values, European way of living, and design in such a way that we support those values, and that's sort of living. 
But then the discussion went forward, and I wanted to ask something else. Uh, is it the fact that two elements are affecting the notion of the activities that are happening in Europe today? One is that we Europeans are taking a lot of our children for granted and are forgetting where we were only 10 years ago, really, and not yes. 20 or 30 years ago. And the second one, the thing that's not really mentioned, and it's a wide topic, and I appreciate that, but it should be discussed, is whether the concentration of capital that we as the world are going through is having an effect. So, so the, the, US, the, the, the concentration of capital uh -huh. and the fact that the middle class is struggling to maintain the way of living that was maintained 10 or 15 years, perhaps, that's to be discussed, having a negative effect on Europe, on the European agenda. Because the fact also is, yes, it is a strongly bureaucratic process to achieve and to receive European funding, but hey, there is European funding that you can apply for to support your project, which was not there before, the, before we had this unit. And that's a very important thing. We seem to have forgotten. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you for that comment. Should I should I reply to that? Yeah, please do. Uh, what I think is very interesting in what you mentioned is the uh, question of whether the middle classes are shrinking and suffering. And there's you know there's various views about that. And as usual, the answer is it depends on where. If you take Italy. The current young generation is worse off than the, than the generation of their parents. That's my impression. If you take Sweden, it's not the case. In Sweden, there is an impression it's the case, but it's not the case. The current young generation of members of the middle and even you know, lower middle classes and former work in service classes, they all have higher living standards than their parents. Significantly. Yet, the reactions that are taking place in Swedish politics are not that different from those that are taking place, or that have taken place in Italy. With a delay, God forbid that we shall not see something like Di Maio and Salvini in Sweden in 20 years, but the rise of populism it is there too, with the Swedish Democrat Party, and even more so, even more so in Finland and, in, uh, even, and even more so in Norway, Norway, which is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, where the uh, current middle class certainly is better off than the middle class parents that they have. Just, just as a quick comment, it's, you know, it, it depends. Again, no, it depends. 